Natalie Portman is here. Her breakthrough role in The Professional proved her a born natural. She is best known to audiences for her work in George Lucas's three Star Wars prequels. Her latest film is V for Vendetta, and here is a look at the trailer. I suddenly had this feeling that everything was connected. We're all part of it. Are we ready for it? The only verdict is vengeance. I am pleased to have Natalie Portman back at this table. Welcome back. Thank you. I am pleased to be back. What's the story? So it's a future totalitarian London um, where the government has become so oppressive that uh, these two characters, V and my character, Evie, who are sort of destined partners, uh, join together to start a rebellion against the, the government. And of course, they're labeled terrorists, mm. which is sort of the, the um, center sort of question of the film. So the so central question is, he's a terrorist, but is, and, and he commits act of terrorism. Well, I think the central question is, when, if ever, is violence justified? And then, you know, how do we draw the line between terrorism, freedom fighter, and, you know, in different contexts, do we have different um, judgments of, of these labels? Um, all, obviously, in the middle of an action movie, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, that's a take it to too extreme, um, you know, about the, the, the provocation. Yeah. And there's also the history here. We've got Guy Fawkes, who was his famous right. character. Right. Who wanted to bomb London. Exactly. Well, the, the Houses of Parliament. That was exactly, in the, 1605. The in 1605. Yeah, um, yeah the Antonia Fraser book, uh, Faith and Treason, about that was really, really helpful with that whole history, especially because Guy Fawkes is the one that we all remember, but he wasn't actually the ringleader. He was just sort of the first one caught and became the symbol of that, and now there's still Guy Fawkes. And he's a symbol for this character here. Right, exactly. Now, who is he, and why does he, why is he hell-bent? What has the state done to him that makes him want to destroy this fascist state? V, you're, yes, you're v. talking about, um, of course. Uh, v is, um, V was put into this sort of laboratory um, situation as a child where they do all these medical tests and they're creating viruses and testing people's resistance to them and all sorts of um, government manipulations and um, oppression. And um, so he has become this character especially sensitive to injustice. Um, and there's obviously further injustice that the government imposes on its people, whether it's, you know, oppression of minorities or, um, you know, curfews or general censorship and, and you know, uh, sort of wiretapping, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and he, you know, becomes politicized, but also he's more of a Greek classic hero than a movie hero because he has this tra tragic flaw of revenge right, right. where often he has very bad sides to him and you don't necessarily like him, which I enjoy because I think it complicates things for the audience. You, you, you aren't told who to like and dislike. And what's the relationship with Evie, your character? Because he rescues her in the beginning. Right. Now, she's not the, doesn't have the same sort of place that she had in the, in the book. In right. a sense, she's now a television person and she was a waif sort of right. on the street in the Right. In the original yeah, comic book. it's sort of been updated. It's interesting. That's one of the major changes from the graphic novel to the film is my character because in the graphic novel, um, she is sort of the street waif who's been brought right. to desperation and is, you know, trying to be a prostitute for the first time, and um, and she's also younger than than the character in the film. You know, minorly, she's more of a, a teenager. Um, but I think you know, since that was also written Cold War era, that the the image of right. mm -hmm. of a dystopia is is was a little different then than today where today you know materialism and comfort you know material comfort um is i think one of the scary things and, and oppressive things that we can imagine today so to make her set in a place where she's middle class and comfort right, exactly. and therefore might be more reluctant to to you know speak out against injustice and what does she go through what kind of evolution because the visible evolution she goes through, she has her hair cut off. Right, of course. That's the physical. And that's the picture we know of you from this movie. Right. Um, well, her relationship with V is really interesting because it, it has all these different 
layers, which is like real relationships in different situations. Sometimes you're the savior, sometimes you're the victim, sometimes you're uh, the tormentor, sometimes you're the lover, sometimes, and they have all of these different levels. And, um, and through these different sort of phases of their relationship, she moves from being someone who is too sort of scared to speak her, mm -hmm. to speak her, her, her mind, her opinion, um, and become becoming someone, fearless. Yes, who loses that fear. One thing about V, he has these superhuman qualities. Right. I mean, he is a warrior par excellence. Right. You know, stronger, tougher. You know. Right. And then someone said this interesting thing about him, that if you give back his goodness, you will take away his greatness. Have you heard that? No, that's really That's an interesting. interesting. I don't know where I read that, but and I should give credit to whoever t said it. But it's interesting and something that somehow if he l it would lose his edge, I guess. Right. And the edge is what makes him great. It, right. the, the whole blinders. Well, it's sort of like the losing fear thing that Evie goes through is that fear is an element of our lives that protects us. I mean, yeah. the reason we have fear is to prevent us from repeating past experiences that have caused us pain, physical or emotional. And, you know, even if it wasn't our experience or an experience we heard about or read about or whatever. So losing fear is, yes, it might make you braver, but it also puts you in a very dangerous place. Um, so he definitely has that, that element. The Wachowski brothers. Yes. <laughs> amazing, amazing Just people. tell me about them because they refuse all interviews now. Right. Uh, even for articles, big articles that are going to help the movie. No interviews. Exactly. We know a little bit from Rolling Stone and magazines about some of their private life. Mm -hmm. How are they on the set? What are they like? Are they strange in all that? They're incredibly passionate about the filmmaking process and so smart and such good people. They're, you know, we would sit on the street, you know, when we were shooting on location in London and people would walk up and not realize they were the Wachowski brothers and come up and and say, oh, what, what's this movie? And uh, tell me about it. And what are you doing here? And and they would talk to them for and they were know, done half by themselves an hour. As a They're just such down to earth, nice, good people. And the part about not doing press, it's it's like the most egoless thing I've ever seen. They just want to make great movies, and it's not about them. And they want to be, they want to have their own lives, and they don't feel like they have to sell themselves to 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 make the movie. And I. I get it. Like, you know, I mean, as an actor, you, you, it's part of the, the deal. But, you know, when you get to a position where you can say no more, I mean, n not to, to overly compliment you, but most interviews are not like this. And it is a lot of trying to get into your, you know, mm -hmm. privacy. And, and it does feel like people are trying to steal something from you. And I fully respect and admire them for, for making those limits. Tell me what this means for you. What, what, what This is a role in which you have such a significant part. Even Star Wars was different because right. that was such a big movie. Right. Well, I was a big fan of the Wachowski brothers and the Matrix, the Matrix yeah. films. Um, so I was excited about working with them because I just feel like they're people who have changed film by, mm. by the, the movies they've made. If you make a movie with them, you're going to grow at least... Absolutely. I knew, I, I mean, when I met Larry at my audition, um, I said, if I do this, you'll hang out with me a lot, right? And he was like, <laughs> yes. And I was like, okay. Because <laughs> he's just some, someone that when you're around, you, you just, you're, you're a better person afterwards. You're, now, what you're is it person. though? I mean, so can you help us understand that. I mean, you're a better person because, you, because they have interesting ideas about the way the world works. They yeah, have, they have uh, they're in touch with books and, and things that have been said. They have a sense of, absolutely. Um, we had like a book circle going around, you know, on set, it was constantly, what are you reading and passing things around and talking about it and saying, ah, this is my problem with it. But, but in a very positive, you know, life-loving, life-affirming way and, and just good people and intelligent and passionate people. You'd work with them again in a second? In a second. I mean, they're, they're really amazing. All right. Take a look at this next scene and we'll take a look at this and then um, talk some more. Here it is. All you have to do is cooperate. <laughs> Process her. <laughs> You had only one haircut to give. Exactly. <laughs> so this was one set. This yes. was one cut. One, yeah, one, we only had one one take. One take, yeah. Um, they obviously had you know several cameras yeah, that right. they had rehearsed many times, and 
and they had, you know, they even practiced the head shaving. They got guys from the crew to, to volunteer to, to get their heads shaven to make sure the razor was working. And yeah. I was just focused on staying, staying But you in had character. one take. That was it. So yeah. you screw this up, you... Yeah, I always feel like an ice skater or something when I <laughs> when I talk about it. One shot, my one shot of the gold. <laughs> when you watch this unfold, mm -hmm. um, did it change your politics at all? Did it have any influence the way you see things? You know, as one twenty-four year old mm -hmm. with a rather extraordinary experience in the world outside of home mm -hmm. and and Harvard, where you graduated in two thousand three. Mm -hmm. um, I think it deepened my understanding of a lot of these questions rather than answer them. Right. Um, these questions are seemingly unanswerable to me. I always get sort of in a hole when I feel like I've come to some point because, you know, I was always, obviously we're raised on nonviolent heroes. We're raised on the Martin Luther Kings and the Gandhi, Gandhis of the right. world. Um, and then you start realizing that, you know, you hear something like Gandhi saying about Jews in the Holocaust have committed suicide. And you think, but that's a, that's a violence against yourself. And, you know, that, mm -hmm. seems, that seems not to be mm -hmm. especially nonviolent. Um, and so you start realizing that there are situations, um, I, I mean, I, can re I realize, I can't speak for anyone else, that I think there are situations where violence is necessary in a violent world. If the whole world's nonviolent, obviously there's a great possibility for nonviolence. But if you have violent neighbors, there do seem to be situations where violence might be necessary. And that's a really scary thing to come to, to a conclusion to come to when, you know, you like to think of yourself as a peace lover. <laughs> and, and I think you or somebody else asked this question, I and mean, you may have said this, what mm -hmm. turns a person is the intriguing question. Right. What turns a person to say, I'm prepared to make that choice. Right. And I mean, when I'm it, being from Israel and hearing stories about, you know, a young female lawyer who decides to become a suicide bomber, I go, why? What mm -hmm. would, what would. Or how do you justify killing innocent people? Right. Is the question. Absolutely. And I don't know if I've gotten to that point at all where I can ever imagine that. Um, but well, where do you think you have gotten? I mean, well, I. I mean, I obviously start with the most basic question, what would bring me to violence? And I think if someone did something to my family or was threatening my family. That's self-defense in part. Self-defensive. But I mean, I don't even know if I could be violent defending myself, but defending people around me I love, I think I'd, I'd be willing to. Um, but then you realize how far that can be extended because... What if a president thinks his whole country is his family? What if you think your whole religious group is your family? What if you think animals are your family? You know, I mean, that can be extended to extremes. And also, what if it's a perceived threat rather than a real threat? And there's so many. That's how it just goes on and on. So, um, obviously, it's mm. there's. You, you have you about. you evidently have quoted something I read. Mm -hmm have watched Munich a lot, Steven Spielberg's I've seen it once. I've okay. seen it once, but I was... Moved very, by it. Yes, I was very moved by it. Because? Um, it really upset me because it hit on my feeling of the sort of impossibility of Israel and something that's almost becoming an impossibility of the United States, too, that feels that in order to protect a place where people can be safe to practice Jewish values, you do a lot of things that go against Jewish values. And the no, United there was States, a famous quote in, in, by Golda Meir. She says, after the terrorist attack, mm -hmm. sometimes a nation has to go against its own values in order to Right, but then there's itself. the you know, Israeli Supreme Court decision on torture that I, one of the, we read it in college and there's a quote about um, part of that, that where they say um, that they are against torture and they say that um, we will have to fight this war with one hand tied behind our back, but we will have the upper hand. And, you know, it's, it, there has to be some middle ground because uh, there's also a Churchill thing where he said, um, you know, during World War II that I heard that they said, they asked him to cut money for the arts during the war. And he said, um, then what are we fighting the war for if we're not, you know, defending our culture? And that's also the, the V quote, my favorite quote in the movie is, is when he says, um, when I say, you want to dance on the, on the eve of your revolution? And he says, a revolution without dancing is a revolution not worth having. 
Mm-hmm. And and that's that's the very basis. I mean, uh, which you, also you reflects wanna... the whole the, the whole other thing of people. I mean, he believes himself a revolutionary. Right. You said when I mean, you were a terrorist, he would accept that. Right. But he believes more than that. He is a revolutionary. Right. And I think most people who are labeled terrorists would probably consider themselves revolutionaries too, which is hard because obviously that doesn't, you can't take this fictional film and then say, okay, I'm with V and then apply it to real life situations. It's obviously always contextual, but, um, but yeah, a lot of, sometimes the cause is just and the means are unjust. And, and that is another, you know, you can Mm. sometimes agree with the cause and, and the, the, the ways people express their causes are very, you know, illegitimate still. There are references to avian flu, right? A whole series of American crises. America's in bad shape during this. Film. Yes, <laughs> yes, America is in bad shape in the future of this film. Yeah. Your politics, not in terms of Democrat or Republican, but are you right. pessimistic about what the way this world is heading? I'm definitely optimistic, um, and I see everything as sort of you know swinging, swinging. A it gets from bad one, one way, and then it'll go and be good again. I hope, but. Your next film, which you've made or not made with Javier Bardem, is yes, Goya's... Yes, I finished. Goya's Ghosts, uh, about the painter Goya fictional account of his, you know... It gets you to Barcelona, doesn't it? We were in um, Madrid most of the time shooting, and it was it was a great experience. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having great me. Great to see you. You too. Natalie Portman, the film V for Vendetta. Uh, it will be talked about. It already is being talked about. Lots of people... Uh, have weighed in in terms of the kinds of issues it raised. It is this sort of interesting combination of a thriller on one hand, you know, and these sort of philosophical questions that it raised. And filmmakers uh, want a lot of people to go, and then they want those people who go to talk about the movie. Back in a moment. Stay with us. <laughs>